What up ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Today we're gonna cover Redux and NG Redux. I did a presentation yesterday at HNJS and I had to cover a lot of content in a short time. And speak like the Micro Machines man to get it done. A lot of information, trying to cram in a small time. Not a lot for effective pausing on important concepts. Thus, today we're gonna take our time and elaborate on some of the points that I don't think got enough detail in the presentation. So let's dive in. <laughs> Programming. Gaming Fitness, Jesse Warden. So Redux and NG Redux is a framework utilized for functional programming. And I didn't know that when I was learning it. I also didn't know you could use it for Angular. I'm gonna explain to you why it matters, why it matters and what's the point of it. What are we doing this for? And then explain, okay, here's how Redux works, which is relatively simple for someone who's used to a lot of large OOP frameworks, object oriented frameworks, and then give you an idea of how it works in Angular from a NG Redux perspective, both Angular 1 and Angular 2. If you're a React dev, you can skip that part. You already know how to use Redux with some helper methods and React using selectors. So a very similar concept if you've already used it in React. So the two things I want you to remember from this presentation are pure functions and Redux solves the bubbling problem. So if you remember those two things, you're well on your way to understanding why in the heck you're actually utilizing Redux. So Redux, what is it? It is a predictable state container. Why is it? It helps you create consistent and predictable applications that are supposed to be easier to test, easier to debug. What does that really mean, <laughs> the what? It really means who's changing my data when and where in some kind of predictable fashion. I know who's changing my data, not classes everywhere and functions everywhere in some random file, some other place. I know when, I have some kind of understanding of when, just like traditional imperative programming, you have to know the history of code and how it's called. I know when and where. The why is, is the more hints as to where those defects are. So if I know the order things change and I have predictable code, then I have a little better understanding of where the, the defects are. So functional programming and Redux don't solve all your problems. You still need unit test. You're still gonna write code that throws no errors and something doesn't work. So you have to go figure it out. The code that you do write is easier to unit test. It requires a lot less time and effort, a lot less code to write, and it's easier to reason about in a code base that you didn't write what's going on. That's what some frameworks are, you know, one of the side benefits that are supposed to do. So predictable how, what does that mean? It means it comes from functional programming being mathematical based kind of constructs that are predictable. Mathematical equations are predictable. One plus one is two. I can say it, you can say it in a different language. We know for the most part, math is universal, it works. So same in programming. If we write something, it's a mathematical is type of equation like algebra, it's a little more predictable. We know that the result is always the same. We do that through pure functions that avoid side effects. So don't worry about all the functional programming terminology and whatnot. All you should care about is this pure functions point of avoiding side effects. So this function here is an example of a pure function, get x. It returns three, and it doesn't matter what parameters I give it. It doesn't matter what order I call it, and really it doesn't matter where I call it, and what class and what scope, it's always going to return three. That's very, very important. Do any of you know what value this get x function returns? Exactly, you have to know the history, when it was called, what was called before it, maybe what was set before it, maybe there's parameters being passed elsewhere like we, it's in a closure we don't know and that's the problem is that this function is not pure it's affected by things outside or to the side of the function so in this case we have var data equals cow so when we call we get a string of three cow but then later we set the data to a number one and then we get a four so javascript either concatenates it if it's a string or does arithmetic and adds it and it comes a number so this is where you can call the same function and get different results. And you don't know, you have to know about the things aside of it, right? So this is not a pure function. Now, one way to fix that and make it pure, and this is if you come from an OOP background or an imperative background, and you start refactoring things to pure functional programming, you're gonna parameterize a lot of things. You start parameterizing a lot and you shrink those parameters down. And now we've said, all right, if we pass in data, we're always gonna get the same result back because if we pass in a string, we're gonna get a string. If we pass in a number, we'll get in a number. So it's a pure function, it's predictable. We set data to cow, we set it in, it doesn't matter because the scope is different. Whatever we pass in from that parameter, always gonna get the same result regardless of what happens outside of it. You notice from the two tests down below. What do I mean by state? What does that mean? Well, if you're building front-end applications, one of the main things you're dealing with is authentication and you don't know who is the user logged in right now. Now you might not have access to all the user's information, but you may have access to their first name and their ID, things like that. So if you're looking at an application, how do you know you're logged in? If you go to Gmail, they know it's you. Where's that state of data stored on the client? A lot of times it's stored in an object, so that's state. Other state could be 
what it shows in edits from routes. It could be the data that you're actually editing that those routes implicate, right? So you've gone to edit a particular user base and ID. It shows it in the URL. That's the data you're editing. It could be where you put things. If you have state in models or in Angular's case in factories or services and you stored that data, it's where you put it. It's often called mutable state because you can take an existing variable or state and change it. But in functional programming or pure functions, you can't change certain things. You can't change one, the number one. One is one, yo. So examples of state would be like window, for example. Window is the global place where you can store things and anybody can access it from anywhere in browser-based applications. So we have a variable called cal that's undefined by default because nobody defined it, so thus it doesn't exist. But we can access that slot and say, hey, do you have a slot of cal? And it safely says no, in this case undefined. We can then set it to mu or mutate it, right? And say that this slot now has this value. We can see that it sets it afterward via logging it. And then we can mutate that slot again from not just a new value, but a new data type. Now TypeScript can help in the data type perspective, but it doesn't help with the mutation. It merely just states that your guaranteed mutation changes to the same data type. So that's basic JavaScript. Let's show you Angular. So if you've done it the old school way of passing in scope, you have a variable that you attach to scope. And from thereafter, Angular's binding takes over and allows you to detect those changes of those variables and update your HTML. So far, so good. Now on the bottom, we're doing the John Papa recommended way where you have a local variable that avoids all kinds of scope problems, but still utilizes Angular's binding syntax for updating variables in the view, the, the actual things that you see on the screen. Either way, you could also use ES6 as well, where you have a model that ref is refactored outside of a controller and you put it in a factory class. So it's just a normal JavaScript class or function, whatever it is, and it returns an object. So that could be your model as well. And you can listen to it via binding. You can listen to it via watchers. You can use getter setters that dispatch change events via root scope broadcast or RxJS if you want to be an early adopter of that. All of those work. This is still a single object or a single slot that you mutate and Angular detects the differences via the observer pattern or their version of it anyway. So that's an example. These are the three main ways of changing state. You can either change it via variable, you can change state with a function, or you can use object assign. So setting variables, we already know about that. You have a slot, you set it to cow, you can mutate the data, set it to moo. So far, so good. You can also set it with a function. And even though this function itself set data doesn't return anything, we know that whatever we pass in is going to set, and we don't know exactly what state data returns, but we do know after we call it, the data has been mutated. It's changed, so we can test for that. So this is normal ways of testing most Angular applications that use mutable state. Object assign is unique. Instead of actually setting data, what it does is it returns an object with properties that are copied. Now it seems like completely different, but in this case, let's, let's show you how it's not that different. So we have a data object and it has one property called value and it has a value of cow. Now I want to change that to moo. So I say object assign, can you please copy this data to this brand new object? I'm going to give you a, that object as the first parameter. Please copy this value and set it. So that third parameter is our intent or object to copy from and it'll copy it to, from that data object to our new one. So you can see on the last two values that the, the data did in fact get set to what we want it to, but it doesn't actually equal the same thing. It's a brand new object. That object that we set in the first parameter is kind of the start. So we get, when we say predictable, we mean pure functions. You can call the same function with the same inputs and always get the same output regardless of where it's called. Very, very predictable code. That makes you feel really good in programming. Anything predictable is good. State is where your data is in the RAM. It's what you're saving. It could be the URL. It could be the user that's logged in, those kind of things. Now let's talk about the bubble problem. I didn't really get to talk much about this in my presentation, but I want to spend some more time on it today to give you, ladies and gentlemen, the understanding of how this can really affect you if you come from an imperative background. Nobody in the functional world seems to think that this is a really big deal and explain how to solve it. And it is, it's huge. When you have to refactor your thinking about how do I code in a functional way, and build a real application that way using an existing imperative language like PHP or JavaScript or whatever else, how do I write my code? And if you're also from an OOP background, how do I refactor my code to make it work and store stuff? Where, do, where does it go? Like, where's my data? I don't really understand it. If everything's new, where's my data go? You start refactoring imperative code, you'll, you'll basically use pure functions. You run into the bubble problem where there's mutable state bubbles up and out of the state. So we illustrated this before with that function where you put data as a parameter, right? Instead of some outside thing. And because of scope rules and JavaScript, it hides that variable. Someone somewhere eventually has to store state by a var const, right? Even in functional languages. 
So if you abstract it into a safe container, you've effectively created Redux. That's what it does. It, it, it puts a nice safe shell around mutable state. So the rest of the world can be pure and functional, but the most important part and the most mutable part is protected by a framework that's unit tested and has large community support and, and practices around using it in a safe way. Imagine you can't ever use var or let only const, right? Only constants in the entire app. When you start refactoring code to only use constants, eventually somebody somewhere has to inject that value into that pure function and on up the chain as you keep deeply nesting functions and factories and views. And next thing you know, you're like, well, who is the dude who has the bar that changes the data over time? <laughs> like nobody knows where that goes and nobody wants to talk about where that goes. So let's let's show you some example of refactoring imperative code. I have this get notes function. It uses the node Oracle API, which is wonderful by the way. Oracle's done a wonderful job as much as Jesse Warden is awful at SQL and loves NoSQL and naturally gravitates towards it because it's JSON, it makes sense to me. I don't have to know about third normalized form and blah, blah, blah. I will get, well, I will say that Oracle has done a wonderful job on this API. It's been wonderful to use, great documentation, really good support on the forums and GitHub uh, issues. You'll notice that this get notes function, all it does is take an account number and go to the database and get any notes for this particular account. Two things in here I've highlighted that are mutable state. The predicates are mutable state, but all those functions are pure. So for now, we're not going to focus on those because those are really easy, simple predicates, just like Lodash. They don't really have any dependencies and you can pass whatever you want and always get the same result. So those are all pure functions, but this Oracle and connection pieces are not. They're both imported via node modules. So they make it very difficult to unit test. The only way to unit test this function would be use something like Sanan where I can dig deeply inside of it or some version of knock that supports an Oracle way of messaging. That's awful. It makes it really hard to set up and tear down and test. And there are a multitude of these functions that provide the basic API of going to our database. So let's talk about how we can get rid of this functional stuff. So this is the integration test. If I call it with an account number, I get, some, get an array. So writing an integration test, not so hard, but once you get a unit test, you start getting into problem. How do we test Oracle get connection? We can use Sanan or some really crazy mocks. Let's refactor this out as well as the config and we'll make them parameters at the top here. Okay, so we can test bad passwords. We can test the Oracle database being down in a unit test where it doesn't actually make a connection to the database. It just runs some code and says true or false. You can verify the functions working out as expected. In our case, we can pass in whatever we want now for the Oracle API and the config and they can be simple mocks. So we can verify that this function works in milliseconds instead of actually having to hit a database. Oracle API config both bubbled up out of there, not mutable state. So someone somewhere has to create that Oracle API and config to pass in a get connection. We now got a pure function for the most part. It returns always the same result with the same inputs. And from a unit test, you'll notice our mock is just an object with a get connection function. And all he does is pass a callback of yay with an object. We don't really care about the result. We just say, hey, if we call get connection, does it work? That's all we care about. And we can put default configuration variables in there, but we could change the config to be a wrong username and password and test that with both the unit test and an integration test of the real database. If they don't match up, that's where we can improve our testing coverage area. Oh, we now gone back to the get notes function with a better pure version of that connection. And we've put him up top. Now you have to pass in a connection that says, all right, you can get a connection, whatever that is, defeat the whole purpose of getting a connection internally. But that connection now has to be created by somebody. So from a unit test perspective, not so bad. We create yet another mock, which is a simple object that is an execute function. So we can pretend to execute queries against the database with a nice unit test that's wicked fast. And we can verify that all our parsing logic works so far so good pretty rad from a unit test perspective. But again, wh who is handling connection? Who's creating that? Here we're creating as a mock, but somebody somewhere has to instantiate it and create it, right? Is that some dude at the top that it's kind of okay and no man's land up there, mutable state's okay? Like, what is that? Well, that's Redux. Redux kind of creates a safe area for us to create mutable state and store our data in basic applications. So you can use it in gaming, you can use it in applications. I've never actually used it on the server. Most of the node applications that I've created are really just orchestration layers or parsing layers or API layers. They're back ends for my front end, so to speak. So they don't really have any state, but on the front end, it's rife with state. So Redux helps you do that. Here's how it works. You got data for your entire application in a single object. You can only change it by dispatching actions with your new value or values. To actually change the data, you use pure functions. So 
This is as opposed to the existing way I've used to been doing it, where data from my entire app is spread out usually over multiple classes and or, you know, files in JavaScript. You change them through method calls, you could change the data through getters and setters or watchers or root scope broadcast, whatever. There's a multitude of ways of doing it for RxJS where you're reacting to those value changes. Made by Facebook and Danny, Dan Abramov. Originally they had Flux. Redux is a version of it that doesn't have multiple stores, it has one, but they have a lot in common. So you've already spent a lot of time in Flux, you probably already know a lot of this already. And it's very similar to MobX as well. So if you want to follow Dan on Twitter, he's also got a wonderful, wonderful explanation of Redux on egghead.io. It's a video site focused on really short videos. They get straight to the point. No people talking heads like me. They just talk purely about code and how to do things. So it's a wonderful, wonderful way. And he covers some of the neat ES6 features that feel like they were custom created just for solving these types of problems. So I, you'll get a lot out of those videos. So let's talk about initial state. We already know what state is. So what's our initial state of our app? It's our data right now when you start your application from scratch or the data from your domain model. It starts as a basic object, right? Whether it's in JavaScript or TypeScript or a class, at the end of the day, it's an object with some properties and your application starts on day one as a, a small little tree. And as you get more features and more developers, it gets kind of big and specialized. Redux is no different. You have the same thing that happens. You start with something simple as this, where you're putting the login screen and you're either logging in or not. So we have a loading of false. You have a login error if you're success, like not successful logging in or not, right? If you just started or it was successful, there's no point of having an error. And maybe you have an existing user. Perhaps you've stored some JSON web token IDs on the local client that are safe to store in plain text. And you can use JSON web tokens to verify. So you read that from local storage. This is a mutable state, but this is what you start with. This is your object of your state as it starts. Over time, it gets big. Here's an example about a 20 screen size app, or 20 view or 20 com smart components, how, whatever nomenclature you want to use. This would be something a little bit bigger. Notice that it's still only about one level deep, right? Each login search, new user role indicates kind of a domain of concern. Developers can focus on login, another developer on search, another few developers on dealing with the accounts and searching of those, dealing with the munging of the data and modifying it around there. So these kind of domains exist on as sibling branches, but this can actually nest really, really deep as you get to larger websites, larger projects. So single object, but it constitutes a significant amount of data. So actions, these are our intents to change things, not just change the data, but to say what happened. What happened is, from a GUI perspective, extremely important. We want to show the user that something's happening or something didn't work and we're finding ways to earn trust and be transparent and say, hey, we're trying to make it work. So what happened? What do you want to change? It's either an object or a pure function that makes an object. So most of us are in a hurry and we create an object, but eventually you should create pure functions. I think the reason most of us don't is creating objects is a pretty common, simple thing to do to JavaScript. We do it all day. So creating pure function that makes objects seems kind of silly, but if you're going the pure, pure functional routes, it just naturally coincides. So this would be a action in Redux. It looks just like an event in JavaScript where it has, it's an object that has a type and some data associated with it. In our case, this is a search action and you know it's a search action because it has a type property, which is the only required property. In our case, it's a string. A better uh, way to write it would to make that string a constant. And the reason for this is twofold. Number one, you can use it in multiple places all over your app and tools like ESLint and other code checking tools, even IDEs that are really awesome like WebStorm or IntelliJ can search and say, hey, you misspelled search. Now you'll notice the string I misspelled. Now code checkers usually aren't going to look at that, but they do look at unused variables and used variables and mis undeclared variables. So if you define it as a constant, you have a better chance, uh, even without TypeScript, of having tooling help you. So reducers are the ones who say, okay, you have an initial state, you have an action that you wish to change it, I will be the one that handles changing the data. These are the guys that are supposed to be pure, but they can be susceptible to mutation. So let's talk about it. Reducers change your data in a response to what happened. That could be something as simple as logging in, or that could be something as simple as you edited data on the client or the server passed back change data. You try to make them as pure as possible. These are the guys responsible for changing your data in a functional way. Therefore, this is where you wanna be the most careful, have the most unit test, blah, blah, blah. They get their name from array.reduce where it takes a chunk of data and reduces it down to what you care about. 
it's not necessarily about shrinking, it's more about making clear. So for example, I had a project where I had to search multiple databases for the same data, but completely different databases in a different age. And sometimes all of those results would say false, like I didn't find anything. That's great, but as the node developer also writing the same API for my own Angular application, on the client, I didn't want to parse any of this. I just wanted an array to show in an ng repeat and call it a day. I found these results in the database. The user doesn't care which database they came from, only the node developer debugging it does. So if I have the top, how do I get to the bottom quickly? Now, here's a more extrapolated view. The first two, Oracle and the mainframe, did find results, different results, but they found them. Mongo didn't find anything, but at least it told me that so I can debug it later, which is very helpful. Now, Lodash and a lot of other libraries have the reduce function, which basically says, all right, I'll take this array and I'll take the piece that you care about each item in the array and then add it to a new one. It reduces it down to the things you care about. But if our array looks like this thing right here, right now, it's search results, an array of objects that have results if they found things, we can loop through each one and say, all right, cool. I ha if you have a result, you actually successfully found things, go ahead and concatenate it into an existing array that we're passing around each iteration of this loop. And you can see at the very bottom, it gets one, two, three, four, five, six, all appended. Wonderful, I can shove that to an ng repeat and call it a day. You'll notice that I pass in an initial array to start this whole process, and that's what pops out at the end. Fantastic. Let's talk about how this process works. I dispatch, I would like to edit a user because my name is Jesse Warden, not an I. I is used for the girl spelling. I am not a girl, I'm a man. I say, all right, here's the existing user, and I'm gonna use a var to illustrate a point here. Before we used a, uh, a completely new variable, we're gonna use the existing same user here in this case. We're gonna say, all right, we expect the first name and last name to be Jesse, spelled wrong with an I, and Warden last name to be true, that's good. We're gonna use object assign again, but we're gonna use the same user. So even though we pass the same value in the front, you can see that it does in fact copy the correct name to the object, but the last name stays the same. In this case, where object assign can still do some form of mutation. This is a reducer function. This is what's gonna wrap that object assign in a safe and pure way. Always gonna get a state and an action, and your responsibility to say, all right, if this action is something that I care about, I'll handle it. Since it's search, it cares about things that deal with search. Now these three actions are probably gonna be the main three things that you do in just about any application. You're gonna do an action that deals with the server and you're either gonna get a result that's successful or an error. Those are the three things you're gonna commonly see all over the place. So this reducer will probably be one team member working on this, another team member working on that, or one team member could be working on the back end API that supports this front end reducer. And what it does is if it doesn't know what action it is, it just returns to state. So it doesn't change it because there's nothing to do. If you're one reducer of many dealing with this gigantic object tree and you don't know what you got, you just return it back. So that way it's safe. Another developer could add a completely different property that you don't care about. And this way they can coexist in a nice, safe, pure way. Now you notice here, if it is something I care about, such as search, I wanna set loading to true so I can bind my loading bar and hide the submit button when you're doing a search. Search error says, all right, we're not loading anymore, but we have an error to show on the client, show them why we couldn't find something. Search result means we got a successful result of data. So we set our loading bar to false. There is no error because it worked. And here are the results. So you can draw them using your Angular repeater if you want to. Now over time, your actions are gonna increase. So what you're gonna deal with is a significant amount of functions and gigantic switch statements, not good. So the way you refactor it is you create additional pure functions and just call it, replace them. They take a state and they take an action and if they know what to do with it, they return it. In this case, these search reducers know what to do with it because they expect to get that particular state, so they just call it. So they don't have to deal with the fact that whether it's a search or search error, they just know if you call it with this state, I'm gonna give you back this action. Same input, same output uh, every time. So they're pure functions. Eventually, you can actually export these functions to their own individual file and then import them. And on a large, large team, you're eventually gonna run into this where each feature you're working on has tons of these reducer functions to modify the data. And while they're all pure, they're not really organized. So I'll show you later on in the presentation how you can organize this in a large team. Now this is how it starts. You might have the actions you care about defined up top as constants. You might wanna have a default state of what your app starts up with because you're not working on login, you're working on search. And since you're in this file all day, you're the developer working on search, you care about what you start up with and what data you expect to see, see when your application launches. So we define that here. And if you look at the state equals default state, that's an ES6 way of defining a default value for a function parameter if you do not pass it. 
Since the first time it's called, there is no state, it's undefined. This is our way of giving it something to start with. And thereafter, it changes every single time. This is still a pure function, we just refactor it out like I explained before. So that's reducers. So again, your concern is if I have so much data on a large project with a bunch of developers, what do I do? Combine reducers is one way where each function maps to a tree. So login would map to the login function or whatever else. Search would map to the search part of the tree and the user role and on down the line. You'll notice I have login instead of comma login. And this is yet another ES6 feature where you can say, look, if the names are the same. There's no reason to go login, colon, login. Just type in login. It's the same thing. But if you wanted your learning, you could say login equals colon login reducer, right? Search colon search reducer if that's what you'd rather do. But again, I just like to match it. I like the ES6 way. It makes it more clear, easier to read. Each one of those would map to a branch on this tree. That function is responsible for the count, that function is responsible for roles, et cetera, et cetera. So nice sequestered, each developer is responsible for their own function or functions of dealing with the main data tree, and they can all work together and not have to worry about mutating other parts of the tree that another developer is working on. And they don't have to create a brand new object tree each time. It's only a piece of the tree that's changed. Lastly, store. Who stores this stuff? Well, this is the, the nice little Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2 that has like the metal arms that holds the sun that's growing <laughs> that he created. This is it's mutable state and dangerous, but store keeps does its best to keep uh, the mutable state away from us and safe. There's only one store in your application. That's the best practice, unlike Flux. However, if you're dealing with a gigantic website or you're doing federated development where you have multiple teams working on different parts under some grand shell or some kind of concept like that, you can create different stores if the teams are large enough. But for the most part, one store should work. And it's actually better if it's one store because it's easier to reason about who's changing your state. Once you make the threshold change to store, hopefully you don't communicate with that team and it's sequestered and never touches your stuff. You access it through get state, kind of pure, right? Because if you change it, the state changes. You update state via dispatch action, your views and GUI, anything that kind of reacts to mutable state like UI. Because again, you don't get new pixels. They're the ones who react to that. And you can set a default state if you want to via a second parameter. But again, like I showed you in reducers, I like to have the reducer set the default state. So that way on large team, each developer knows what reducer they're dealing with and what their default data is. And they have some kind of understanding of the world. If another developer doesn't know why a piece of the tree acts that way, they can go find the reducer for it and figure it out. So basic create of a story is to import the function. You get your main reducer function, whatever that is, the thing that changes your data and you pass it in the store. Done. A lot of times the second parameter is going to be the default store. You can also pass middlewares or plugins to make Redux act a certain way, but this is the basics of how you create it. And if you want to see what's inside, you call get state. It gives you what it is right now. Notice I make it a constant because it's going to be different later. So it's state A, state B based on changing something. They have a store subscribed to listen to change events of the state where you call get state within it. But most GUI frameworks have connect functions that allow you to say, call this function when it changes and I'll map things for you. Probably not gonna use subscribe unless you're building like a game or something. Great store, you can pass default data to the second parameter. It doesn't scale very well, mainly because each reducer as it grows over time knows what its default state is and it uses ES6 default parameters. So you don't see that often where you hydrate a state with something from the server. Change it later. You call it store.dispatch. So this is where our actions go. I remember all those actions we were creating? This is where they go. Did it change? We can use the unit test to verify once we dispatch an action, the data did in fact change. It started as a blank string. And now at the end, it is the search text that we put in our action. If you want to stop listening, store.describe or some of the connect methods that the plugins give you. We turn an unsubscribe function so you can unsubscribe. In Angular's case, when a view gets out of the, the routes, goes away, the controller is destroyed, that's when you call unsubscribe, same for React. Data flow, I'm not really a big fan about this. You kind of just learn this as you use the framework, but it's a big deal for people who are not used to dealing with extremely large applications, lots of developers, lots of data going on, front end, back end, and push. Sometimes it's very reactive. They're just not used to it. Redux as a framework makes it a little more predictable. So you know who's changing what and where, you can follow all the change events, blah, blah, blah. Ones you care about are store dispatch, changes in action, the reducers say, okay, I'll take that request and give you what the data would change to. I'll give you a brand new object. The store goes, cool, thank you. I'm going to save the old state tree. I'm going to give the new one to what you do as the active state. And then it's going to say, hey, if anybody is subscribed, I'm going to broadcast a new state to y'all. So that's the flow. And this makes it really simple on the surface to know if something broke, where to look. Batch an action and something doesn't happen. It's probably because your reducers didn't hear it. Or you misspelled the action or your reducers are not returning the, the correct data. 
A lot of the login tools will show you the before and after, so you can compare and contrast, which is really nice. If nobody's subscribed, they're not gonna change. So even if all that code's working, but your UI doesn't update, it's probably because their subscription model or connect are not actually firing to those data being changed. It gives you a nice hint to know. And if you didn't write the application, you already have an understanding of how the data flows through it, whether it's Angular or React or frame, you know, Ember or framework you're not used to. Let's go through that four step process. Number one, I wanna do a search. So I dispatch the search action with some text I wanna search for. The store goes, okay, the current state right now is this. The action you dispatched is this. Reducer, what happens if this is my current state and somebody dispatches this action? What, what would the search area of the state tree look like? It gives you back the next state, right? That's the reducer's job. Cool, I'm gonna save it. If there's any other reducers to call, I will. Get the new state and I'm gonna dispatch to the world. Hey, if anybody's listening for subscribe, here is your new state. The reducers told me this is it. So that's the four step process. Got Redux down. Let's talk about ng Redux. This is yet one implementation of taking Redux and dealing with Angular. So no longer are 50,000 factories and controllers changing data. It's now up to Redux. Our controllers are a bridge to Redux. You only really care about the last three. The first thing you set up once, never touch it ever again, unless you want to talk about lo loading for logging for production, for example. We set it up with Redux provider. We create a store with it. The second parameter is an array. That array is usually your plugins, sagas, your login modules, and maybe if you're using the React dev tools, which kind of work for Angular. Not really, kind of, sort of. That's it, that's all you need to set it up. So whatever your config phase is your project, you're good. Now from a controller perspective, whether you're using smart components or dumb components, I don't really care. We wanna pay attention to these two methods on the bottom. If you're doing Angular 1, using John Papa's style model, we care about on destroy. This is a method implemented in Angular 1.5 and above for components to say, hey, your controller or component is going away. It's gone from the screen, not being displayed anymore. I'm gonna destroy it. It comes obviously after ng on init, or in this case in Angular 2, it's ng on destroy. So this is where you're gonna unsubscribe. Map state to this is the connect method. So it's a little easier for you to say, here's my object, Angular to redraw this, rather than dealing with subscribe and looking at the state tree of the store and blah, blah, blah. Because usually when you're building controllers, display one part of the state tree, right? Search, login, completely different things. Same thing in Angular 2. So when we call ng Redux, which as you can see is an injected variable up here at the top, ng Redux, we call connect and say, hey, call map state to this with this scope. And what you're responsible for in map state to this is to map your variable. I'll show that in a minute. When you destroy it, you just call and subscribe. Now, normally you would call promises or methods on factories that you abstracted away to make a lot of code a lot easier to deal with, return queue promises and call it a day. Using Redux, you let it handle that. So in our case, we're gonna log in with these, this data of whatever my idea is. You'll notice I pass in Angular dependency injections. So in this case, Q, HTTP, and state. These are asynchronous options that I also want Redux to handle because as those things change state, they're gonna change the state tree. Now things like Q and state and UI router, they have their own state. So I'm not gonna duplicate that in UI router. You'll see tools out there like, I think it's ng Redux router, stuff like that. You don't have to worry about all that. Though they handle their state really well you can react to that state and put it in your own Redux container. And the great thing about Angular over React is that we have dependency injection, unit test and integration test all your Redux code and not have to worry that you have to have mocks and things like a change. All the Angular mocks change these things at runtime anyway, so all your unit tests and integration tests work as is because they get mocks at runtime when you use an Angular mock. So wonderful, wonderful way of benefit of using Angular with Redux. Now when we map state to this, instead of going store.describe and calling get state and walking through the tree and mapping it, if you're familiar with Martin Fowler, he talks about in a lot of the MVC and model view presenter architectures, one of them is called supervising controller. And this is kind of it. Your controllers in Angular for your components say, all right, that state tree over there is the data, but I want to slightly modify it so it can display correctly in my world. You'll notice I have an extra property Loading, obviously, duh, if it's loading or not, we wanna show loading spinner or not, that's pretty simple. But has errors too. If it has an error, we're gonna map that to an ng if, right? To show the div or not even created at all. The login error is the actual thing we display in text. We just return an object of what it is to do. It'll automatically map this to our VM back up here, all our values based on that scope that we passed. So you can use Angular's dependency injection out of the box. React will actually react to those changes and render them manually using JSX and try to abort as quickly as possible in that render function to make it efficient. In Angular, we don't have to do that. We just set a bunch of variables and Angular's data binding magically updates the HTML for us. So I consider it a lot less work. ng if on this p tag, it's not even gonna draw it until that variable is actually true. If it does draw it, it's gonna show that login error. 
based on the state tree. MD Progress is a material design progress spinner bar, and it's only going to show if it's loading. And obviously, we want to use MD Show so we don't have it popping around in the div. The air is the only thing that I want to kind of move the UI as it's being created to let the user know visually that something has physically changed. Now, the last part I want to point out is if you're dealing with Angular 1 and 2, if you're a React developer, you already know about this from the whole smart components and dumb components. If you're a Flex developer, this there is no distinction, right? But Angular 1, if you've not used Angular 1.5 yet and used a lot of components, both in Angular 1.5 and above and 2, they encourage unidirectional data flow. And what that means is you have one-way binding forever. You never use two-way binding ever again. You can still do that. It's fine. But I encourage you not to. And if you look at the bottom here for username and password, those bindings that we're exposing internally, anytime you use bindings in Angular 1 or 2, make them one way and let Redux handle with that map state to this changing. So if anybody anywhere changes the data, you can react to it and show the new data. You don't have to bind to some model. Those days are over. File organization is quite a challenge. A lot of people building large applications, it's hard enough to map your mind to smart components and dumb components and putting those in folders. What you don't want to do is have a folder called reducers and a folder called sagas and a folder called actions. Like it's just not scalable, especially on a large team. Instead, I encourage you to read Cliff Meyer's article that's still relevant today, three years later, about feature-based development instead of using the sock drawer. And he talks about building your features. And as your features get large, you create a new folder that's a sub-feature. So it could be mapped to routes. Some people map those folders mentally to the routes. Some people just mentally map those to features or the domain model they care about. They, whatever their product owner or designer says about how this UI looks, they look at that Photoshop comp or sketch comp and they mentally map those blocks of the UI into smart components and kind of folders. And if they get the code gets really complex, the DOM gets complex, they just map those to subfolders, keep it nice and organized. Same with here. We have a roles section. It also corresponds to a roles section on the state tree. We have our controller here, our component here. We have our page for functional testing. And you'll notice we have a roles.reducer. This is our reducer and our routes because the roles actually has four separate routes to go to. So it appends the UI router. The saga's here. And you notice there's not a lot of unit tests because I'm a horrible person. But that's where they belong. So that way, each developer or team of developers can focus on their folder. And as soon as it gets kind of big and complex, they can refactor to subfolders. So the code can grow and scale and be nicely organized. And the things that relate to it are there. They don't have to find some global utils kind of function. In conclusion, Redux gives you a two kilobyte functional programming framework that ensures your data is kept as pure as possible. If you're trying to get into functional programming, you read Eric's article about pure functions and you're trying to learn that, you quickly run into the problem of, okay, what framework do I use to do functional development? Somebody's got to figure this out. Well, they did. Redux is it. It gives you a clear data flow of the action. So if you want to know, I look at this application, I've never, I, I, I'm new to the team, they're using Redux and Angular, I've never coded either. How does this change? Well, Redux tells you, it's fashion action, the reducer changes it for you, the store says, okay, it tells the world. That is how it all works. And store is not something you really deal with, so you only have to care about those three. The, the store itself, you don't write code for that. You only write your own actions, your own reducers, and your reaction code of subscribe and views. A single data store which scales to multiple functions and classes. So if you look at functional programming, it scales very well because each one of those functions is pure. Therefore, each function can, using ES6, can export out of the modules. Those can go into files and folders and organize there and complete different teams. So even though it's one state tree, you may never even look at a completely other section of the tree for months on end. It solves the functional bubble problem. So if you're coming from an OOP or imperative background like me, and you factor imperative code that you've either created yourself because of muscle memory or just for doing it for 16 years the wrong way, this you'll start bubbling up those concerns and the parameters. This helps solve that via pure functions. So I've got some resources for you. If you read these in order, I guarantee you, you'll have the what I would like to call the fundamentals to proceed to the next lesson. I've gone through hundreds of awful and somewhat okay blog entries and tutorials and things like that. And these are the best, except for number three. I wrote that, it's not the best. It's just my interpretation of, okay, here's what you need to know because I got so frustrated about people not writing in a mathematical or professor type of way. So read these in order and you'll understand the best way to understand why you're doing it and the best way and why we're doing what we do and how you can get better, some of the tips and tricks they offer for all the e syntax stuff. Really, really wonderful set of resources that helped me. So if you got any questions, you know me, Jesse Warden. This is my YouTube channel. Hit me up on email or hit me up on Twitter or leave a comment. Hope that helps you understand why the pure functions are valuable, how Redux solves it, and how it solves the bubble problem. Thanks for your time.